Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, let's turn to the book of Colossians. One last, well, last time with me uh, next week, um, uh, Bishop, uh, for the next couple of weeks, he's going to finish Colossians 3 and and 4. And today I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, uh, As promised from last week, we started chapter 2, 1 through 7. It's personal for Paul. We saw why it was personal. Uh, And then today, verses 8 through 23, it's doctrinal for Paul, um, and we're going to see that. But on my drive down, I I just really um, felt, uh, I don't want to say convicted, but but just uh, impressed upon that uh, I need to do something a little bit different because of the nature of this text, this section of Scripture, um, very sterile, very... Um, very wooden, maybe, uh, or doctrinal. Um, I, I wanted to, to, to leave you with this. So here in just a second, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give you, if you have a copy of your bulletin, you'll see it up on the screen. Um, I'm going to give you these four points quickly. Somebody said, can you do it quickly? I don't know, but I did it in first service, actually. Um, and then I'm going to transition to another text, <clears throat> which, you know, is, is not completely like me outside of reference, but I think it would be more appropriate as my um, last Sunday, which is not, um, you know, the end be all, okay? Um, but leave you with some encouraging words from the Apostle Paul. So you're going to have to listen quickly here. Um, So if you're taking notes, grab the pen, grab the paper, and we're in Colossians 2. And uh, so let me pray and then we'll get started. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your son and his sacrifice on Calvary and that resurrection. um, Father, that would give people an opportunity like Angel and so many others, an opportunity to place their faith in you through faith, through grace, as it's already been read this morning in Ephesians 2, Lord, and their lives radically changed. And thank you for this young man. Thank you for his family. Thank you for the example that's before us all. And would you encourage our hearts this morning um, in whatever passage and teaching you would have for us? Thank you for the, the worship, the fellowship already. And we give you the honor and glory in Christ's name. Amen. So I'm not going to read verses 8 through 23, but I'm going to leave you with some homework, okay? I'm going to leave you with some homework to do. Um, I haven't asked much of that. Uh, of you in my time here. And then I'm going to transition to really, uh, I'm going to leave you with where we kind of began a year ago. Um, So think about the series you were in a year ago. If you weren't here a year ago, no problem, I'll help you. Um, So there's, there's four things that the Apostle Paul is trying to push back on at this church, this first, second century church at Colossae, this false teaching that had crept into the church. We've already talked about that. Um, Paul's under house arrest. This is one of the prison epistles uh, that he's writing. And um, these terms, these four terms, they're not original with me. They have been throughout church history. And even most theologians and scholars and even commentators would categorize this section of Scripture, 8 through 23, with these four false teachings or these four heresies, if you will. So uh, I'm going to give them to you uh, up front, the four, so you can fill in the blank. And I'm going to go back and explain with one sentence or two, each one, and then we're going to transition, okay? So those four false teachings are this, Gnosticism, that's the first one right there, Christ, not Gnosticism. The second one is legalism, Christ, not legalism. The third is mysticism. 
And the fourth is asceticism. I think I'm saying that right. Um, Gnosticism, legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. Asceticism. If I'm not pronouncing that right, bear with me. I've got cookies on my mind or something, but... Anyway, so here, here they are, and you see them on the screen. Take a picture so you can do some uh, homework later on this week. And then you'll be ready for chapter 3 next week when Bishop uh, brings the word. Be here, support him, pray for him. Uh, you'll be blessed. So uh, Gnosticism, and, and if you remember, verses 8 through 10, um, really... Uh, uh, believe that Paul is talking about Gnosticism here. It's a personal or special revelation or knowledge. You hear the word there in Greek, kenosis, knowledge. That's what it means. It's special knowledge that is limited to a select group of people. It's like a, it's like a club, right? Um, like where, where we're privy to God's revelation and the rest of you peons are not. Now, who just determines is in that group? I have no idea how they do that. But you can see the problem, right, where this creeps in. And, and really, for the first 1,500 years of the church, there was an element of this in the church prior to the Protestant Reformation. This is why the 95 Thesis, Martin Luther's thesis on the church at Wittenberg, October 31st, why am I forgetting the date? 1517 was so critical, one of the top 50 significant moments in all of Western history. Gnosticism, that's 8 through 10. The second form of false teaching that had crept in the church and the the apostle Paul was pushing back on is 11 through 17. It's legalism. What do you mean by legalism? Salvation by good works. I didn't tell Greg to read Ephesians 2. Uh, I, I, I don't know why he read Ephesians 2, but it is grace by faith alone, not by anything that I bring to the table. It is grace through faith in Christ that brings about salvation. And yet throughout church history, it's well, if you do this and if you check that box and you say this and you go there, then you can earn salvation. That's legalism. The third is Christ, not mysticism. That's an alternative form of consciousness, whether it's through uh, uh, meditation, whether it's through uh, uh, other substances that the earth provides legally, illegally. It is a uh, alternative state of consciousness that brings about a special union with God. And then the fourth and final is asceticism. That is resisting the pleasures of the world um, that ultimately brings about Pursuing salvation, right? So I'm sacrificing the, the pleasures of the mind and body that bring about salvation. Or at least the pursuit of it. So while there inherently is maybe a little bit of truth sprinkled in each of these isms, right? Um, they're, they're, they're dangerous. And if we're not careful... You and I are swayed by the latest gimmick, the latest teaching, the latest revelation, the latest the Lord has spoken to me, you know, the latest prophecy, you name it. And, and this is why Paul is talking about knowledge. It is vitally important for you not to rely on me. You say, well, what, what, good are, what good are you? You're exactly right. I don't know. Um, but the Lord has given us, according to Ephesians 4, men and women gifted in the church 
And, the, and, and ideally, pastors, um, those who are s- m- spiritually, emotionally, um, I don't want to say advanced, but mature or uh, wise in their faith, we take a guy like, um, like Angel or others, and we, that's where discipleship comes in. So they grow up in the faith. They're taught to think on their own. They're taught to believe on their own. But we guide them. And we trust the Lord with the rest. So that's the four. That's the doctrinal false teachings that have crept into the church. Now, I didn't want to leave you with just that rigid of a talk. So you got your fill in the blank. If not, take a picture. Um... And that lasts longer, as they say. And I want to leave you with kind of where we begun a year ago. Um, just turn a couple of pages to your left. <clears throat> I want to be mindful of the time before us. Um, we have Lord's Supper after. <clears throat> so when I joined you about a year ago, I was not your interim until <clears throat> December one. <clears throat> but the weeks prior to that, um, some of you guys preached. It was my friend, Dr. Michael Wright, preached. And, <clears throat> um, and then it was me when you can find nobody else. Um, and then you couldn't get rid of me some reason. Um, I wasn't arguing. The food down here was incredible. The hospitality was bar none. <clears throat> but I thought it would be fitting to leave you with this letter that we started with a year ago, but, but selfishly and secretly, that's no longer a secret. This is my favorite book to preach because it just resonates with me. <clears throat> and about where I came in was Philippians 2, the second half. But what I want to do is go to Philippians 1, which I was not privileged to share with you. Somebody else was, and that's fine, but it's been a year. You probably don't even remember. Um, But here's the significance of this book. Because, sure, there's joy, there's partnership in ministry, there's all of these things. But the Apostle Paul, don't miss this, is writing this letter in prison, like he did the church, uh, like he did Colossians. He's writing this letter about a decade removed maybe even 12 years removed from his last interaction with these folks, at least face to face. Why that's important to me is because of the nature of my work. To this day, and and I have shared this with staff and I have shared this with your key leaders, um, Almost more important than me being here week in and week out, almost more important than that is the relationship that I have with the church or some of you. I can't have it with all of you. It's just mathematically impossible. The relationship I have with you when I leave for me is just about as important as anything else. Imagine receiving a letter, 10 years removed, an email, a text message, a phone call, whatever it is, from me or me from you. That's the beauty of the Christian body. It does not start and it does not end with me. And I would even argue it does not start or end in the, in the time that we live right now. It, it transcends all of us and all things and all time. This is the beauty. This is why it's the church universal. Sure, there's other churches around the block. I get it. And we're all different. And and, I mean, shoot, we're different even in a Baptist church. We're different. That's where the rub is, right? But the beauty is, is that the Paul that Paul can write this letter to a church that he helped start, the first church on European soil, <clears throat> with a ragtag crew that were the charter members, Lydia, uh, uh, um, a demon-possessed girl, and a jailer <laughs> um, that was suicidal. 
It's, it's really fascinating. And if we're able to just remove our preconceived notions and see, you're like, oh, how precious is this thing we call church? And when I say precious, I don't mean perfect. I mean, it doesn't take you long to figure that out. <laughs> We're far from perfect. So let me leave you with these words. I'm going to do more reading of Philippians 1. <clears throat> um, and here, here it is. And this is really a picture of a pastor's heart. A picture of a pastor's heart, whether it's staff pastors, whether it's uh, lay pastors, volunteer pastors, right? Or whether it's interim pastors. Or whether it's any other servant, it is still mindful for us. It is still a good reminder for us to have this posture. So here it is. Like in Paul's fashion, he starts with a greeting and then he gives thanksgiving. Verse 1 of Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. With the elders and deacons. The bishops, the deacons, the pastors and deacons. It's two offices. Like we have two ordinances. We have baptism and the Lord's Supper. There's two offices in the church. That doesn't mean it's le le leadership is limited to those two people. All of us are called to ministry. Okay? These are the leaders of the church. Paul's writing this letter to them a decade later. Did I mention 10 to 12 years later? Don't miss that. Verse 3. No, he says, grace to you, verse 2, and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> verse 3, I thank, here it is right here. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I love this because he's saying, I haven't seen you in a decade. But I thank my God every time I remember you. I am... Listen, one of the, the burdens of what I do, and not because I'm special, it's just because I don't get to, as I mentioned last week, I don't get to worship often with my family. It's so much of a burden that last week my, my girls were like, wait, we get to see you on Sunday now? Like, oh, like I thought they'd be excited. <laughs> they were like, oh, we get to do our own thing. Me and mom, right? Like, you're really coming? Like, what? I'm like... <laughs> Wow, thanks. Yeah, I was like, okay. Um, I'll travel a little bit, girls, but not as much as I... Okay. And um, that's the burden of not doing that, right? And, and then, but, but the blessing is, is that every time, I mean, to this day, even yesterday, even this week, I am in contact with a church that I have served previously. Lay people, staff people, senior pastors, deacons, you, you name it. And for me, that's why I say that the relationship I have when I'm gone is, is almost just as important, if not more important, than the work in between. And for some of you, I... I hope that continues. As a matter of fact, you want my email, you want my phone number, you can contact the office. I'm giving them permission to share it. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have it, just be patient with me in my, in, in my uh, response time. It's nowhere near what it used to be. Um, but, but that's what happens when you go to churches and you build all these friendships. It's like, it, I'm, I'm a blessed man. And like Paul, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. And in prayer, and I will be doing that, praying for you with joy for the fellowship in the gospel that we had from day one to now and even beyond. Look at verse seven. Just as is right for me to think this of you because I have you in my heart. I'll, I'll have you in my heart forever. 
The things I did good, I can take from. The things you did good, I can take from. And even the things we didn't do so well. Even the mistakes that we fall into. I told Jim a few weeks ago, I was like, okay, I messed up there. I can take that and put that in my toolbox for later. and Hopefully learn. And that the older I get and the longer I do this, the gap between right and wrong and make mistakes and, and, and to, you know, that, that shrinks, right? Because I want you, I, I want, I, I mean, you're in, you're part of me. We're part of the body of Christ. Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me. And when I travel, I get to take a little piece of Calvary Baptist Church with me when I travel. The good and the not so good. The mistakes and the successes. I still tell stories about my last pastorate. I've been gone six, seven years. I'm friends with the pastor. I'm friends with the people. That decade of my life, I had no idea how it was going to help prepare me for this kind of work. Partakers with me. So when I travel, just think, you're going with me. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in discernment. Don't be all about the feels, right? It's not good just to keep me around because you like me. That's, I mean, because if that was the case, then the ones that don't like me would want me gone and you know, that's just part of life and leadership. It's okay. But he says, knowledge, discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, verse 12, that the things which happened to me or us have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ Jesus and most of the brethren in the Lord having become confident by my chains. We become confident in suffering are much more bold to speak the word without fear. That fired me up, angel, if he's in here. That fired me up. That should give us boldness and courage. Verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Paul says, regardless... You're going to have people, right motives, wrong motives, doing good, doing bad. He says, regardless, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. My prayer for you is that this pulpit, Christ is preached. And that in your life, Christ is preached. I don't know who your new pastor is going to be. But I pray he has the boldness and courage that when I was pastoring, that if I preach anything but Christ, I'm telling my men, take me out to the shed and hide me. Not like hide me, but that's an old term, I think, for, you know, bend over, Alex, right? <laughs> okay, a PTSD for some of us. Right? Um, but why would I not want that? It is the one who cannot be corrected that I'm concerned about. Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Verse 19. I'm wrapping this up. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Whatever it is you're going through right now as a church, it will turn out. It will. Through your prayer and supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation... And hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified. Not only Christ preached, but Christ magnified in my body. So this, this next few, these next few words, 
Paul's mantra, right? Whether by life or death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So that's why when we go through it, man, like, uh, okay, we can, we can sulk and be sad and pout for 24 hours. But hopefully beyond that, we move beyond that. To, to have this, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is his motto as it should be ours. But if I live on in the flesh, he's torn, right? This will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell for I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better than you bums. He says, actually, he didn't say that. Um, because we mess it up, man. He's just saying it's just better to be with Christ it's, it's, it's fair to say that Paul struggled like many great ministers and pastors and evangelists and missionaries throughout history with, with, with the form of depression and just constant angst. Like, is this all that, like, I want to I go home. We say it. He says, which is better? Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue. And you all for your progress and joy of faith that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Last few words here. Chapter one. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel so that whether I am there or whether I am not there, I may hear of your affairs, your life, your witness that you stand Fast in one spirit, Calvary, with one mind, striving together to the faith for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversary, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God for you, for to you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. This life is not easy. Leadership, ministry, it's not easy. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. And you can go on to chapter 2. I love, love that that section, mutual submission. But I want to leave you with this. From your vantage point, from the chairs you sit, whoever's preaching, whoever's leading in worship... It is very natural for us to think, constantly evaluate, critique, think what what it is. We're thinking about what we're thinking about, about the person up on stage or the person leading or the person talking. But whoever is in front of you, whether it's the pastor, whether it's a missionary, whether it's an evangelist, whether it's the worship leaders, whether it's your Sunday school teachers, your Bible study teachers, your disciple leaders, whoever it is, whoever that new pastor is for you, could you do me a favor at least a couple of times a year, maybe, maybe three times a year, um, at least two or three times a year, could you write where you are, whoever the person is, and take this approach to, to, to worship just for a moment. And like Paul is thanking God for the people, have you ever stopped to wonder what pastors think about you? You are always thinking about the pastors or the people in front of you or the people leading or talking. But what I'm trying to say is, are you, are you encouraging or building in such a way that 10 years has passed and you can look back or he can look back and say, I thank my God every time I remember you. Or does he leave thinking, Whew, I thank God I'm out of there. I have those conversations on the weekly. Zero exaggeration. Now, I'm not Baptist exaggeration here. I have it on the weekly. Where pastors are fed up with the people and the people are fed up with the pastors. 
Could you build and encourage your leaders, your next pastor in such a way that no matter where he goes or when he leaves, if he is to leave, can look back and say, I thank God upon every remembrance of Calvary Baptist Church. I would be not exaggerating. I would not be exaggerating if I did not say um, that I don't feel that way about you, especially to the ones I've gotten really close to. And I will take that with me wherever I go, and I will forever be indebted.